Chapter 12 I first met the world's best magician when I was but a freshly sprouted man. I had just dropped my testes and my voice cracked with manhood just arriving. I was a wandering fool, a boy finding his place without any place to place his foolishness. I made my living the only way I knew how, by telling tales and emptying wallets. I pocketed what I picked and kept what I conned. Blink and I've got your wallet and your heart. Which, young lady, do I have of yours? Oh, you son of a... Ski fumbled around for her pill purse, which was gone. Again. Ah, alas, enough about dear old Cram Grammy and his always growing wealth and unmatched charm and wittishness. This is a tale about him, about he, supreme master of the unbelievable and purveyor of the impossible. Not one shred of this story is fictionalized, not one tiny teat. Everything you are about to to hear is of the damnedest be damned truth. Vant and Ski settled into their armchairs, each with tall glasses of wine that Grammy had poured for them. He continued, One day, while out in the fields or in the storeroom or up in a very high tree, uh, something along those lines, a, a curious man came to town. Uh, he had quite the appearance. I, I, I'd never seen such a fellow. His capes gleamed the greenest of green. His peepers were the brightest of brighties. He walked as if he floated, and he hummed a delightful tune. Something, dare I say, otherworldly? Of another dimension? There were four chords which harmonized with the melodies, and his tones danced on the chords. How did such musics come from the mouth of one? mere man. I followed him closely. Grammy went on, spellbound by his own voice. His hands moved to the rhythm. They led the orchestra behind his esophagus and his eyes floated towards the heavens while his feet knew exactly where to go on the ground. What was his destination? Who could tell? Certainly not I. But that did not hesitate me from desiring to know one thing about him. One particular thing. Where did he keep his money in those flowy capes of his? You see, in those days, I had a one-track mind. Now, of course, it's two tracks. What with manlyhood and all. But back then, it was profit or pss. So I did what I always did. I ran the scam. My companions, I knew them all. The three-step Charlie, the lullaby Lookaloo, the Twix Twizzly. But with this fantastical fop, only one such trick would do the trick. I settled on the buxom Betty, which any man, even one with these levels of flamboyancy, would most certainly fall for. Excuse me, good sir, I called to the strange gentleman as I summoned my faithful servants, my tear ducks, while raising the pitch in my voice to the peak of patheticism. My dear mommy has vanished, and I've not the faintest where she went to. I'm oh so frightened. Thankfully, I never leave home without a picture of her. Perhaps you, a, a, of such high character, can identify her, had you may have seen her. And with that display of helplessness, I showed him a photo, the likes of which would make any man buckle in his boots. It featured a woman with a bosom so beyond bountiful nomical that one would be forgiven for breaking all bonds of faith and commitment. Right then and there, her corset was practically bursting apart as her two attached milk sacks... We get the idea. Shh. Kind of like this part. As I was saying, before I was interrupted by the bringer of good taste to the proceedings, her tits were huge. Any sane man would drop all pertinent business to quite obviously begin a hunt for this woman. 
Provided, of course, he still had his nutties and fancied a lady. With his mind a-floating in the land of sin. I had intended to pock his picket and lift all desirables as he was lost in fantasy. But this man, he did something so unexpected, so bizarre, so unanticipated that it almost gave the whole scam away. What did he do? He said, oh, Caraville? She's a few towns over. Well, come on then. It's a couple of weeks back the other way, but a child simply cannot be without his mother. He... He knew her? He said he did. But who could tell? At first, I thought this had to be a ploy, that that he had outsmarted me, that he was bluffing. But, my lady Skeetavi, he gave such the impression that he was acquainted with the buxom beauty in the photo, the photo of which I had harmlessly removed from a landscape gossip rag. I had certainly never met this lass of so many men's blind admirations, So I did the unexpected to this unexpected turn of fortunes. I followed him for two weeks because, comrades, I myself wanted to meet her. Quite suddenly, I began a quest not for riches, but for hooties. Grammy gulped down his wine and refilled all of their glasses. Moving on, we quickly walked and constantly talked although his phrasings were rarely intelligible. He told me jokes with no punchlines, and he spun yarns which changed characters and settings without rhyme or reason. I would have most definitely declared him mad, but he described my lovely lass in such tremendous detail. Furthermore, he apologized repeatedly for defiling a woman he had no clue was a mother, and one who someday would misplace her child. He said, had he been aware, he would have behaved much more gentlemanly upon the completion of their communion. Now, at this point, there's something about him you must know. The most amazing thing about him, the most fascinating thing about him, and I beg you, compatriots and confidants, to believe me when I say this, the most incredible thing about him was his magic. His magic, my chums. His magic. The man could do it. Grammy noticed something and paused his story. Does it hurt you when your eyebrows burrow deep into your nose? He said to Vant. Why, if your chin is the destination, I'd say those two fuzzy worms were well on their way. Well, all I tell you is true. Truer than true. So true it's almost false. He could do magic, the real stuff. Sure, he could roll pills through his fingers and be tricky with card decks, but also he could do the impossible without so much as blinking twice. He could change colors around, make people believe they were carrots, make up become down and down become left and left become backwards. Things that had to be experienced to be believed, which even then they never quite would be. All along our journey, I asked him questions that never got answered. And how he came to be, well, that never quite came to be. Yet, the one thing he always described in glorious detail was a show. The show. He was always planning a show. It would be grand, it would be gay, and it kept his top a Twitter. The last carefree companions. We arrived at a small town on the outskirts of Land Escape. Back then, if you remember, a few of those havens existed. Peaceful little places before the nomads turned to organized savagery for shame. This was a lovely place. Windmills and waterfalls, flowers and kitty cats and all of that. Of the several shacks and cottages... Our magician marched straight up to a door of no particular flavor and knocked upon it exactly twelve times. That's the number of love, no one else's but hers, he said to me. Don't remember to forget that soon. Very important. And then the blastedest thing happened. 
The door opened, and sure enough, it was her. Grammy sucked in all the air he could to steady his wobbly head. Majestic. A bountiful bundle of matronly mammaries. She looked upon her visitors and smiled, and then spoke words I will never forget as long as I live. What were they? Hello, she said. Hello. He repeated the word over and over until it felt exactly right to him. It took about seven tries. Had she met him before? Ski pointed to the magician's room, which had grown quiet. He must have been listening. Or sleeping. Oh, dearie, no. But he took her hand into his and tapped on her palm twelve times. She asked him, do I know you? He said to her, yes, you don't. Of course you do, but, but not today. <laughs> she, she giggled, smitten with the stranger. He waved his hand like a fluttering bird, twisted round and round until a trail of red came out of her heart, and with a flick of his wrist, she and I were intertwined. I'm not sure how or why, but we were embraced. My giant head fell between her giant flubies. She whispered in my ears such sweet everythings, and I cried like a child who did, in fact, find the mother he was looking for. Vant found himself awestruck in the insanity, albeit hesitant to buy into it. Although, he conceded to himself, my story to others would sound equally impossible. More so. That was the day from whence I never left the man's side. We worked diligently. We prepared for his infamous show. We did small, one-on-one -on -one gigs and impromptu sideshows to amass pills and materials. We went town to town in search of those willing to be entertained and not murder us at the gates. Turns out, even the devout and dogmatic enjoyed a bit of magic, although we stayed away from the scary places. Years passed, comrades. We were inseparable, the two of us, two gigantic peas in one gigantic pod. Over time, we built ourselves a name. Well, we built him one. We built our band of traveling entertainers. We played shows for wanderers happy to pay us. We paid for nomads happy to protect us. We bought animals and tanks and a militia and an honest to snot clown or three. We had a plan and a damn good one. We would hoof it to the wealthiest town around, which as it so happened, was a place where I could also dampen my doodle. Why, Crash Town, of course! There we'd play the greatest show the world had ever seen, make our fame and fortune, and then with our pockets stuffed with pills, move on and take permanent residence in Landescape, free of our manly juices so we could concentrate on our spectacles. We sent promoters ahead. Barkers, we called them. Folks paid to spread the word and put our signs up all about town. We built up the hype and reserved the Spectorum Maxima. What used to house the sweat of athletes and the might of gladiators would soon witness the magic of the unbelievable. And I, as the world's best manager, would be entitled to my fair share. Old W. That's what I used to call him, short for the W in his nickname, has never been too keen on counting green. Thankfully, however, I had the perfect man for the job. Myself. <laughs> the Spectorum Maxima is gargantuan, but we sold the place out. Sold her out. 50,000 folks filled the seats. We were swimming in pills, my confidants. Merchandise flew off the shelves. There were hats and shirts and cloaks and toy wands, mare sticks from the forest, of course, that we peddled for ten green pills apiece. The whole place chanted, Dub ya! Dub ya! My friends, it was a sight to be seen, a most powerful sight, a most ass-blowing one. Grammy caught his breath. He adjusted his level of intensity and lowered his voice to a step just above a whisper, so his roommate in the other room would not overhear. As I said before, confidants, I was a pup. 
Maybe I was in over my head. Maybe my pointer got out in front of me and I couldn't put him back in my pants, but the truth is, I noticed something askew when I mingled with the crowd. There was wagering going on. Betting. They were betting on who would win the fight. Trouble was, no fight. You see, in Crash Town, it's either effing or fighting, and there wasn't anything sexy on the poster. Comrades, they came for blood, and we had none to give them. But no matter, I thought. They would be wowed when they saw what the world's best had up his sleeve. Real magic. Certainly he'd bring down the house. Confidants, the lights dimmed. A hush fell over the crowd. Spotlights blasted the floor of the Spectorum Maxima, embrightening the stains of blood and the cages his opponents should have been cowering in. But at the sight of no opponents, the audience took a turn. He walked on out. This, this idol I looked up to, this person of power, this Born entertainer who changed every life he touched. He walked on out to center stage, looking tiny, so tiny. Just a man. I smelled trouble deep in my bones. When I saw him standing out there, shivering like a wet puppy after a bath in ice water, I started gathering all the pills I could. I stuffed my pants, my pockets, my socks, my ears, my armpits. I got to the floor of the arena as close as I could and set my mind on planning an escape route. I knew, I, I just knew we'd need it. Grammy downed another glass of wine. What had started out as an anecdote was becoming a confession. Never should have done it. Put him in that arena. This town. It's possessed. It's violent. I, I, I turned a blind eye. I got greedy. Vant coughed. Okay, okay. I, I got greedy-er. I should have walked away. I should have started in land escape. About 10,000 shudders floated in my brain, all fighting to be the King Crapper. And now, forgive me for what I'm about to say about my lifelong friend. Grammy scratched the back of his head nervously. He screwed the pooch right in the stinker. Ski frowned. Vant had an unexpected urge to put his hand on her shoulder. He shook off the impulse. He tried to churn up whatever energy he usually does to begin his tricks. Does this thing with his hands, you see. Problem was, nothing happened. I've seen him do his mysticisms a million times, but this time a whole lot of Jacko Squatto. His face. I'll never forget it. He was scared. He was confused. Out there, all alone. He didn't know what to do. Nor did I. So there we were. Two self-made kings of the world, pooping ourselves like babes. He kept trying. Kept trying. I shouted to him, but the crowd roared louder. Confidants, you've never heard such awful things. Fifty thousand folks came for blood. And damn it all if they weren't going to get some. I ran to the center of the arena where he was getting pelted with everything from popcorn to piss, and I pushed him into the escape route, down into the trenches. I moved slow, weighed down by all that loot. I mean, at least I'll walk away with something, I kept saying to myself, as I fled with my friend under my arm. He was crying. Hard. Saddest thing I ever saw. No one should ever have to see their hero with red puffy eyes and dirty red cheeks. Horrible shame, that. Horrible. Grammy struggled against emotion. His voice wobbled. Ski pretended to rub her eyes, fooling no one. She was wiping away renegade tears. 
We got out of there by the tips of our foreskins. Fifty thousand rushed the floor out to get us. Later, I heard hundreds died in the riots. Thousands were injured. They had turned on each other, this riled up crowd without release. Our fault. Our fault. Blood on our hands. No question. No doubt. Anyway, we hid, tucked ourselves away, had enough pills, plenty in fact, to rent our lodgings. What lies before you? Not a bad place for those who don't want to be discovered. But grudges don't die easy in Crash Town. I'm sure you've seen the slander while out and about. People don't forget, won't forget. Even after all this time, it's still not safe for us. So here we are, trapped. Hiding from a whole city that wants our hides. What happened to him? He stayed in his room. Ate, pissed, shit, slept. That's it. But then, one day, near two and a half years ago, just like that, he was back to his former self. Up like a balloon, shot out like a cannon, up and speaking his usual gibberish and strategizing his next big spectacle. Been in that mode ever since, planning the show which, compatriots between you and me, is never gonna happen. The truth is, since that fateful ass-handing day, I've never seen him do magic. Not once. Honestly, companions, I'm not quite certain he can even do that stuff anymore. Grammy flopped into his armchair. I don't know. For the first time, I saw bigger winnings in the real deal than in the sneaky peek or the Freddy foot face. Thought I could make something. Create something. I was the guy bringing magic, real magic, to the world. Serves me right, I guess. I'm not destined for anything like that. All I've got is the con. <laughs> I'm a con man. Simple dimple. I'm good at tricks, but not at magic. A long pause threatened to go on forever. Finally, he spoke again. Well, on the bright side, I have plenty of time to reflect and plenty of drink to help me do so. He poured himself yet another generous glass of wine, which he slammed. Why don't you leave? Well, the rent is low, you see. I, I mean, leave Crash Town. I I I'm afraid I... Don't quite understand, my dearest. Go somewhere else. Start fresh. Go somewhere? Else? <laughs> my bony cherub, there is no leaving this place. A realization washed over Vant. He had been prioritizing a departure without having truly considered the feasibility of the act. Just piecing it together now, are we? How long have you been here? Weeks? Months? Oh, <laughs> look at you two. Now you know why there's no mirrors in Crash Town. You're not the prettiest of sights. Face it, friends. You've crashed. Bullshit. I call bullshit. There's got to be a way out. There's always a way. Plenty of ways. No shortage of them. The thing is, they all come with terrible odds. Literally terrible odds. In the casinos, you can bet on those trying to escape. The wall is monitored, and anyone that gets anywhere near it becomes a public spectacle, broadcast all about town. Vant continued to think. Grammy broke his concentration by taunting. Think you can get past the junkies at the gates with even a scrap of loot? Or maybe you're nutsy enough to grapple with the peacekeepers? Fancy a tangle with the nomads outside the city? Or perhaps you've taken to the notion that you'll buy a sparkling jet bike from Corpo and fly your way out. <laughs> that holographic ceiling does more than just look pretty. That sucker's dangerous. Get too close and you'll blow the hell up. I've seen it happen. Comrades, if you heard even one of the stories of botched attempts over the years, you'd get the idea out of your mind post-haste. The house, my companions, always wins. I know somebody who beat the odds. Yeah, my dad. Are you certain of this? 
Somebody with resources has been hunting him. He's convinced the guy escaped. Your father was this Whispers fellow, correct? You act about him all around town, along with my magician. Give me a few days. Perhaps I may figure out how he did it. I know people who know people who, who know people who know people who know people. I'll make you both a deal. I'll sniff out your father's exit if you get me and W through it. Vant knew it would be hard enough for Ski and himself to slip out of town undetected, adding a bumbling buffoon to the mix, and his certifiable friend would certainly make it impossible. Sensing opportunity slipping away, the charlatan kept pressing. Let's look at the bigger picture here, comrades. The four of us, we have a chance. Ski shot daggers at Grammy. The five of us. How dare I forget dear Cassidy. The truth is I could never leave Crash Town myself, not even consider it what with lovable bonkers to take care of. But with your muscle and weapons and their cute little ass. Vant turned sour. Sorry, <laughs> Habit. Uh, just get us out into the open and we'll figure our way to land escape on our own. Maybe I can make a dishonest buck in a decent place for a change. There's no one left to scam in land escape. Some awful things went down there. The three of them sat in silence, staring at the floor. Then we'll go with you, wherever that may be. You're joking. What would I do with a thief and a lunatic? I'm quite helpful. Truly, I am. Arguably, he's not. Grammy tilted his head toward the magician's door. But I can contribute magnificently. What's our plan anyway? Where are we headed? Look! Look at this charisma. Infectious, right? I'm a natural. What's the mission? Rescue a thousand prisoners from an evil army. The two of you? Against an entire army? Well... Vant looked over at Ski. We hadn't really discussed it. It's just me for now. Ski rolled her eyes. Vant had no idea if it meant that obviously she was going to help, or obviously she wasn't. I have decided... Grammy said in a grand gesture woozy from the booze, to sleep on it. Vant made no attempt to hold in the criticizing laugh that fell from his throat. He was not surprised to see the cowardice behind Grammy's pomp. Ski eyed the door to the magician's room. I want to talk to him. Go right ahead. Ah, he's harmless. Won't lay a hand on you, although he will flirt. And he gets quite stinky holed up in there. He'll clean up if you ask him to. He's polite. If a bit clueless. I'll be fine. She stood up and walked to the door. She knocked. Mr. Magician? World's best magician? Stop! Stop, stop, stop. Don't call him that. That's the one thing he hates. Don't ever call him that. What do we call him then? The world's worst magician. <laughs>